Okay, chapter 11 and chapter 12, there's only three more, there's only three chapters left. Uh, and then we'll ta tackle chapter 13 on the 10th week. And that will be it. We'll be done. So get all your stuff in. Um, I'll try to get it. I'll try to get it graded. I've got lots to grade, as you can imagine. Right at the end of the semester is when a lot of people turn their stuff in, and that's okay. That's that's fine. Uh, you know, it's been a it's been a nice, long, pleasant summer. So I hope everybody had a good time. Uh, and we'll get our, our stuff done as, uh, whenever it happens. So here you go. Let's go ahead and start off with al altruism. Uh, altruism uh, is uh, the definition of altruism is, is helping other people. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. In 1977, Everett Sanderson jumped down on the subway tracks to save the life of Michelle de Jesus only seconds before the onrushing uh, train would have struck her. After failing to jump back onto the platform, Sanderson was pulled to safety at the last instant by onlookers. In 1999, David Huttmacher uh, was uh, diagnosed with diverticulitis that required him to miss six months of work. With Christmas approaching and his sick and personal leave running out, David was surprised to discover his paychecks continuing to be full. David's co-workers had donated their own sick and personal leave to make up his shortfall. In 1999, athlete Yukiko Marth uh, developed an aggressive form of glomer uh, glomeronephritis uh, that required an immediate kidney transplant. Um, they decided that dialysis uh, would have uh, wouldn't have been enough. She needed a kidney transplant. Uh, Charlie Keyes, a person that she had a passing acquaintance with, uh, donated a kidney and saved Yukiko's life. Al-Qaeda terrorist Usman uh, Khan uh, attacked the patrons of a London museum with knives and a suicide vest in 2019. After killing two patrons and wounding three, Darren Frost and John Crilly chased Khan out of the building and onto the London Bridge, where they parried the knives with a five-foot uh, narwhal tusk, tusk and a fire extinguisher before Khan was shot and killed. Uh, and that's the only way they kept him from killing more people. This is the tusk. This is actually a tooth. Uh, there's one of them on, on a narwhal. Uh, you can look it up if you like. It's called the unicorn of the sea. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, a narwhal is a uh, type of uh, whale. Uh, it's not as big as a blue whale, of course. Uh, but this is, this is what this guy looks like. And he was trying to keep the guy from... Uh, from uh, uh, killing more people, and they were, uh, they were. He was sticking him. He kept jabbing him with his with this tusk. They had uh, attacked him uh, inside the uh, museum with another narwhal narwhal tusk, and uh, he had he chopped it into pieces. Uh, but this one was a little bit uh, sturdier than the other one, and uh, they were able to uh, uh, to subdue him and tackle him. And uh, since he had a suicide vest on, they weren't exactly sure what was going to happen next. So the police shot him and killed him to make sure that he didn't explode the vest, which turned out to be a, a fake suicide vest anyway. Uh, 2007, Cameron uh, Hollowpeter was uh, waiting for a subway train when he suffered a seizure that threw him onto the tracks. Uh, Wesley Autry, this is uh, Hollowpeter right here. This is uh, Wesley Autry. Uh, seeing the dilemma, jumped onto the tracks and was able to roll the unconscious man into a trench and cover him before a train uh, crushed them both. Uh, so he, uh, uh, it was close. Uh, he, they both almost got run over. Uh, 1982, Air Florida Flight 90 crashed into the frozen Potomac River in uh, Washington, D.C. Five passengers and a flight attendant clung to wreckage in the frozen river as a helicopter plucked them off the debris one by one, and sometimes two by two by two. Uh, ignoring his own safety, Arlen Williams helped the other five survivors attach themselves to the rescue, rescue ropes uh, to be whisked to safety. When they went back for Williams, of course, sadly, the cold had claimed him, and he had slipped into the water and drowned. But he saved all the other five people. 
African-American Otis Gaither uh, smashed through the door of a burning mobile home one night and pulled white uh, Larry Whitten to safety. When Whitten failed to respond, Gaither replied CPR, despite the racist symbol that fluttered over the burning building. And that, of course, is the Confederate battle flag, uh, which is considered to be a racist symbol. The Avenue of the Righteous Among the Nations is a line of trees planted commemorating the hundreds of Europeans who saved Jews during Hitler's Holocaust. At great peril to themselves, they provided haven and food for the members of the hunted religion. Samaritans, this is a parable that Jesus told. <clears throat> Samaritans were people of mixed Assyrian and Israeli ancestry who maintained a religion that was similar but not exactly the same as the Israelis. Because they were different, they were despised. Literally, they were despised by the Israelis. Uh, one day, an Israeli merchant was robbed, stripped, and left for dead along the road. A priest and a Levite uh, saw him and hustled away. Now, uh, you, you need to understand who these two people are. The priest was, of course, a rabbi. And the Levite is, uh, all, uh, all rabbis come from the Levite class. Uh, so he was a uh, considered holy, holier than other people. Uh, because he was of this this class, this Levite class. A priest and a Levite saw him and hustled away, uh, seeing his nakedness and, and not wanting to soil themselves by by looking upon his uh, his nakedness. A Samaritan came along and bound the merchant's wounds and carried him to an inn to recuperate. He gave the innkeeper a sum of money and promised to make up any difference if his, uh, his need uh, exceeded the money that he left. And this is uh, known as the parable of the Good Samaritan, uh, whereas uh, a Jewish individual uh, was uh, rejected by his own people, and it was someone that, uh, that Jewish people nor despised at this time. Of course, this was 2,000 years ago, and he was the one that helped. Altruism is the act of concern and helping of someone else with no expectation of gaining anything in return. Why people help has been the subject of much research. The social exchange theory purports that people weigh the costs of such interactions and seek to maximize their rewards and minimize their cost. And this is a social exchange theory. So if you've ever given money to, a, uh, to somebody that, that needed it, um, without uh, expecting anything in return. <clears throat> no one was around to see you do it. Uh, the only person that knew about it was the uh, person that you gave the money to. Uh, th that really goes against the social exchange theory uh, because uh, the rewards they're talking about uh, is, uh, is usually an external reward, but sometimes it's an internal reward. Rewards provided for helping may be external or internal, External rewards may be in the form of appreciation or friendship. Therefore, we are more likely to help someone whose approval we desire, someone attractive to us. Internal rewards include increased feelings of self-worth, but it also includes reducing the feelings of distress that one might feel caused by the empathy for someone else's pain. Internal rewards, uh, Clary Amodo and Snyder researched people who volunteer to help AIDS patients. They found six motivations. Uh, the first was values, uh, to act on humanitarian values and concern for others. Uh, understanding, to learn about people or learn skills. Social, to be part of a group and gain approval. Uh, career, to enhance job pro prospects with experience and, and uh, contacts. Uh, ego protection to reduce guilt or, or escape personal problems. Uh, esteem enhancement to boost self-worth and confidence. Sounds like a city person, doesn't it? Uh, some might contend that altruism so, uh, has so many internal rewards that people do it more for their own benefit than that of others. Thus, they contend that altruism is a form of egoism where the real benefit is that of the giving individual. However, Daniel Batson <clears throat> sees altruism as working both as a self-serving and a selfless act. Batson referred to our focus on the sufferer's distress as empathy. 
genuine sympathy and compassion for the other individual. Such empathy comes naturally. Other animals will come to another's aid. Uh, they will comfort a sufferer. Uh, they will comfort a victim. Uh, they will show distress at another's emotional response. A newborn baby will cry when they hear another baby crying. And of course, I've worked in in, uh, in neonatal uh, intensive care units and and uh, and newborn baby uh, uh, areas and. Uh, the nurses always hated to see me because they thought if I made one baby cry, all the babies would start crying and they'd have to take care of all of them. Of course, uh, the amazing thing, they actually liked seeing me because uh, I, I rarely made the babies cry. I was pretty quick. Uh, the faster you do it, the less likely that they will feel anything. Uh, so, so they actually kind of liked seeing me. I... I was pretty good at getting blood out of baby's heels. Oops, there we go. Empathy produces uh, helping even toward members of rival groups. With their empathy aroused, people will help even when they believe no one will know about their helping. With their empathy aroused, people will violate their own standards of fairness and justice by giving the person favored tr treatment. Sometimes people will help others when there is no self-interest involved, but because society prescribes the helping behavior as a norm. There are two social norms. Reciprocity norms are expectations that if you help a person, they will help and not hurt you. Social responsibility norms are expectations that people will help those dependent upon them. Evolutionary psychology purports that animals are driven to maximize the survival of their own genes. Thus, an individual is more likely to put their children's welfare ahead of their own, though children are less likely to sacrifice themselves for their parents. This kin favoritism is referred to as kin selection, favoritism for those who share our genes. This favoritism may be prevalent with people who aren't actually relatives, but who look similar to us. Evolutionary psychologists also believe that we may help others because we expect others to return the favor, and this is known as reciprocity. While reciprocity is unlikely to work in large impersonal urban areas, it does tend to work in small isolated groups. People in a small group feel closer to the others in the group and will often sacrifice for them with the understanding that when fortunes are reversed, reciprocity will happen. Large and impersonal sometimes has the opposite effect. So the word reciprocity means tit for tat or for giving something back. Uh, you do something for me. Uh, you do something for me. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And that's what reciprocity is. Um, I, I had a teaching. I used to have a, a high school teaching license. And... Uh, we always hoped that uh, we would move to some place where they had reciprocity. In other words, uh, they would recognize my uh, my teaching license from from uh, Nebraska uh, in uh, Oklahoma or uh, in Mississippi. Uh, you know that was that was always the hope that it would still be good in another state. You know, one state that ha doesn't have reciprocity is California. Uh, and I always had trouble every time we moved to California. We we moved there twice, uh, and I always had trouble finding work in California. In 1964, Kitty Genovese was attacked by a knife-wielding rapist in front of her own apartment house in Queens. This is Queens is in New York, New York City. For 35 minutes, she fought off her rapist while screaming in terror in the middle of the street. 38 of her neighbors were aroused and observed the attack from the safety of their homes. None helped. None even called the police. Kitty Genovese was raped and died from her wounds. Uh, this, was, this made the headlines. Everybody was shocked. Andrew Mormiel uh, was attacked on a crowded subway car. He was knifed in the stomach. His attackers left the car at the next stop. Eleven riders watched the men bleed to death as they rode home and didn't lift a finger. 
An 18-year-old switchboard operator was sexually assaulted while working alone. She escaped out in the street naked and bleeding with her attacker in pursuit. Forty pedestrians watched as the attacker tried to pull her back inside. Two, police in ha two policemen happened by and stopped the assault. This isn't the lady that was assaulted, by the way. That's just a picture of a, a switchboard operator. Well, she's not really a switchboard operator, is she? Uh, Eleanor Bradley tripped and broke her leg in a crowded street. Dazed and in pain, she pleaded for help. For 40 minutes, shoppers merely parted uh, and flowed around her. Uh, this is in uh, New York City again. A cab driver finally helped, uh, finally helped her to a doctor. Uh, she had a broken leg. In June of 2000, a parade that wound past uh, Central Park took a turn for the macabre uh, when groups of drunk men began dousing women with water and tearing the clothes off of and fondling the female parade uh, watchers. And Peyton was forced to negotiate her way home with her underwear torn away. Uh, police ignored the problem and no calls from cell phones were received despite the thousands who watched the attacks. And actually, uh, if you type in Ann Payton, there is a video uh, that she uh, she's in uh, where they have torn her clothes off and she's crying. This is this is actually Ann Payton. Um, nobody helped. Um, the men were drunk. Uh, nobody, and you can hear what they have to say in this video. It's really kind of shocking. The Kitty Genovese rape and murder was a wake-up call for social psychologists. They had no idea that people wouldn't help when they saw and when they knew something bad was happening. Unwilling to accept the callousness of Kitty's neighbors, psychologists began researching to discover how and why such egregious crimes can be watched and allowed to continue with no one lifting a finger to help. Noticing the by this is this is not so they came up with this concept of the bystander effect, and uh, they came they they came up with uh, uh, different aspects of the bystander effect. Uh, noticing uh, researchers discovered that people in large groups are less observant than people in small groups. Research done with smoke pouring from an air vent demonstrated that people in large groups took four times as long to see the smoke. Thus, the people in the crowd parting around Eleanor Bradley may not have even noticed Eleanor laying there until after they passed. With advance notice and a less crowded sidewalk, the individual may have been more likely to see Eleanor and evaluate her need. That's kind of being kind of kind, I think. Uh, but in, the larger the group, the less people notice things. They're, they're trying to uh, maintain their own presence in the group. <clears throat> they're watching other people and they really don't have time to see an anomaly. That's being awfully kind. Uh, uh, yeah, it's being awfully kind. Interpreting uh, the larger the group of people, the more likely an individual will accept the uh, implied definition of an event of the group. If, every, if everyone else in a group seems unconcerned, an individual is less likely to interpret a situation as negative. This is partially due to pluralistic ignorance, the mistaken interpretation that others are feeling what we are due to our illusion of transparency, the overestimation of others' ability to read our internal states. And of course, we assume that people know exactly what we're thinking, even though that's impossible. Uh, but uh, this is the pluralistic ignorance and illusion of transparency. Latin and Rodin uh, sta staged an experiment around a woman in distress. 70% of the individuals, when alone, responded to the woman's obvious distress. 40% of the pairs responded to the woman's distress. So when somebody was with a partner, a, when it was a couple, they were less likely to help than if somebody was alone. Of the 60% who didn't respond, most interpreted the situation as a non-emergency. In other words, their interpretation was incorrect. Uh, they weren't really noticing what was happening. They were assuming everything was okay. As the number of people witnessing the emergency increased, the less likely anyone would render assistance. And of course, this is part of the bystander effect as well. 
Assuming responsibility, not only are people more likely to misinterpret an actor's actions while in a group, but they're also more likely to misinterpret the willingness of other bystanders to help. It seems that more people who witness a situation, the more likely each is to assume that someone else will take responsibility for the situation, a diffused responsibility for the action. And this is what seems to be happening the larger the group. Why should I help? I'm 72 years old and I'm only five foot six. Uh, this is this is a case for Superman, you know, one of those kind of deals. Diffusion of responsibility studies in large cities and more rural settings show that the fewer the people involved, the more likely people will intervene. Yosef and Corte, uh, looking at New Yorkers, uh, failure time and time again to respond to the aid of other individuals, refers to the atmosphere in large municipalities as sensory overload and compassion fatigue. To exonerate humanity when people are with people they know, they're more likely to try to help. But when you're walking alone down a street, you're, you have all of this, you've got all these people around you, it's sensory overload, and of course, uh, because you're in the city and, and everybody needs something, you've got compassion fatigue. In 1967, Brian and Test <clears throat> researched helping patterns in Los Angeles. Uh, they discovered that people were more likely to assist a female driver with a flat tire if they observed someone helping a female driver with a flat tire one quarter of a mile up the road. And usually what happens is if they see somebody helping with a, uh, help somebody change a tire, uh, by the time you get up to the, the uh, person, uh, it's too late to stop. So if you see it, uh, if, if you're approaching somebody with a flat tire uh, and you've seen it in the, uh, uh, in the past uh, down the road before you got there, uh, then you're more likely to help. Brian and Tess went to New Jersey to observe the donation patterns of Christmas shoppers. They found that people were more likely to drop money in a Salvation Army kettle if they had just seen someone else do the same. And, of course, one of the things that I do is anytime I pass a Salvation Army kettle, I try to put money in it. And uh, I try to get my grandson to put his money in it. Not his money, it's my money. So I give him, I'll give him a $5 bill to stick in the Salvation Army uh, bucket. And uh, at first he would argue with me and say, no, I want to keep the money and buy a toy. And, of course, you know, I convinced him that it's nice to be nice to people. Tried to anyway. We'll see what happens next Christmas, I guess. Rushton and Campbell found that British adults are more willing to donate blood if they are approached after observing someone who has consented to donate blood. One factor of modern life is time restraints that we all live under. A clever experiment by Darley and Batson in 1973 pitted seminary students and a homeless man. Now this this one really pisses me off. <laughs> Seminary students are people that are learning to be ministers or priests or rabbis. It's a school for to teach people how to preach. After listening to the parable of the Good Samaritan, they had just heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. Did they not take it to heart? Two groups of seminary students were confronted with a groaning man on the way to an appointment. For the students under no time constraints, two-thirds stopped to help. Of the students under time constraints, only 10% stopped to help. We've got a man that's groaning on the street. These, are, these people are going to be ministers, priests, rabbis. <clears throat> of course, every, every uh, denomination has their own... Uh, colleges and of course their seminaries so they would all be priests or they would all be ministers or, the, or they'd all be rabbis actually uh, seminary for rabbis is named something else and I can't remember what it is anyway so here's the part that really upsets me these guys are going to become ministers they're supposed to uh, help the community and one-third of them with no time constraints, pass this guy by, even though he's groaning in the street. 
90% of them did that if they had an appointment to go to. What a great excuse. It just upsets me that uh, the people that are supposed to be the helpers uh, don't always help. They're too selfish. Ugh. Researchers have often discovered that people who have been induced to uh, lie will feel guilty to the extent that they seek to reclaim their public image. Even when guilt is not observed, the subject is more likely to seek retribution by volunteering or redeeming themselves in one way or another. <clears throat> negative moods. Researchers have delved into the effect of other negative moods other than guilt and discovered that sometimes it causes less helping behavior and sometimes more. With children, negative moods tend to decrease helping behavior. With adults, negative moods tend to increase helping behavior. Researchers assume that, that with the adult mind, self-gratification and inner rewards are more possible than they are for children. When researchers looked at the different generosity of elementary, junior high, and high school students, they discovered that as the children aged, they tended to become more socialized and thus more generous. Agreeing with Piaget's developmental theory, children are born selfish and become more and more altruistic as they develop the ability to see the world from another's point of view. Researchers have discovered that in most cases, when people feel bad, they try to do good deeds to make themselves feel better, except in two circumstances, if they're grieving and if they're angry. They also found that when people feel good, they tend to do good deeds. Looking at personality traits, researchers have discovered that <clears throat> there are individual differences in helpfulness and have shown that these differences persist over time. There are a network of traits that predispose a person toward helpfulness, those uh, high in emotionality, you know, empathy, and self-efficacy. High monitoring people are helpful if they think helpfulness will be socially rewarding. So if somebody's watching, they'll, they'll be helpful. If nobody's watching, oh, they pass them by, just like those crazy ministers and priests and rabbis. Uh, correlational studies looking at 172 studies have shown that when faced with situations where strangers need help that is potentially dangerous, men are more likely to help than females. In safer situations, however, women are slightly more likely to help than men. Eagley and Crowley speculated that over the long term, rather than the short term of most experiments, women would be seen as more helpful than men. While there are instances of religious leaders making some fairly significant sacrifices, studies show that intrinsically, religious people are only slightly more likely to help in cases of minor emergencies and spontaneous helping acts. As far as donations are concerned, however, 24% of the population makes 48% of the charitable donations. Gender, looking at 35 studies that compared help given to men and help given to women, men were more likely to offer help to women than to men. Women offered help equally to both genders. Women were more likely to be offered help than men, and single people are more likely to be offered help than two or more people. Men are more likely to offer help to attractive women over unattractive women. Women tend to seek uh, help more than men. Similarity, people are uh, not only more likely to, to like people who are similar to them, but they're more likely to help people who are similar to them. Less than 50% of people dressed differently may change for an individual as compared to two-thirds who were dressed similarly. When race is a factor, people will help unless the bystander effect is in, in force. Hmm... Researchers have found that any technique that personalizes bystanders increases willingness to help. Personal requests, eye contact, uh, stating one's name, anticipation of interaction. People are more likely to donate blood if they, the appeal is personal and from a friend. People obviously care about their public image, especially individuals high in self-monitoring. The door-in-the-face technique is a strategy for letting, getting people to help by making a large request 
that they will no doubt refuse, and then accepting a smaller, more reasonable request. Using the door-in-the-face technique, researchers at Arizona State were able to double their contributions. So you ask him for $1,000 and then say, well, do you think maybe you could give us uh, 500 uh, And then if they say no, you, then you go to 250 And if they say no, then you say, well, how about just $35? And a lot of people will donate $35. Uh, po uh, political uh, parties do this type of uh, uh, solicitation. Researchers and historians have discovered that people tend to create a circle of inclusion about them of the people that they, uh, they attribute similar moral values and rules. This is known as moral inclusion. These are the people that you will help. Not, this is a circle of people that you will help and that you feel have the same moral values that you do. And that's one of the reasons why you're willing to help them. Moral exclusion, on the other hand, are all those people outside the sphere of people seen as similar enough to be included? And of course, these are the individuals, if you're willing to stop and, and help a Navajo, uh, but you're not willing to stop uh, and help a, a, a Milagana, uh, then, then the moral, your moral inclusion is uh, the people of, of the Navajo Nation. Um, and your moral exclusion would be Milagana. And of course, if, if a, a, a white person uh, will only stop for, uh, for other white people, then that's their moral inclusion. And of course, if they won't stop and help anybody that's indigenous, then that's their moral exclusion. I didn't want to paint a picture that, <laughs> that, that uh, this doesn't occur with other individuals. Researchers and historians have noted that individuals who have no moral uh, model to copy are less likely to maintain an altruistic attitude. Susan Harold was even, has even found that pro-social television programming is modeled. However, if people are rewarded or bribed to do what they already like doing, they may lose the intrinsic reward and see the act as extrinsically motivated. And this is known as the over-justification effect. Um, in 1985, <clears throat> I was living in uh, Plasmouth, Nebraska, and we were starting a high school soccer team. And I didn't work for the high school, uh, but I agreed to uh, coach the team. And, uh, of course, I was thinking, well, you know, I'm volunteering my time. Uh, but they said they couldn't do that. Uh, they needed uh, to control... Uh, they needed to pay me so that uh, if there was any any problems that they could take my money away, <laughs> they thought that that was better. And and, and that was, uh, I didn't feel as good about it. If I had donated my my time, uh, I still would have uh, coached the team, and but I would have probably felt a little better about it. And that was uh, a, a case of over-justification effect. I coached that team for five years until 1990, until my kids moved away and, and, and my wife got an assignment to, uh, to Oklahoma. So yeah, I coached that high school soccer team for five years. Plattsmouth Blue Devils. We weren't too bad. Okay, that's the end of chapter 11. Uh, the next chapter is not nearly as much fun. The next chapter is about aggression, about hurting other people. And there's not a whole lot of good news in here. Uh, the world was shocked in 1993 when the body of a two-year-old boy was found brutally beaten to death. Two 10-year-old boys were implicated in the crime by security camera footage. The case of the beating to death of James Bulger uh, confounded police initially because the blows were not characteristically severe enough to indicate an adult. And this is them. They, they got them on CCTV. Uh, um, uh, this is in England. Uh, and the, here's the two guys uh, trying to pick out which kid they're going to pick on. And that's the kid in the brown jacket with, uh, with uh, uh, James Bulger. They took him out to a railroad track and beat him to death. So they had planned it all along. You can see them doing that. And it shocked everybody. 
The world celebrated the destruction of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Not three years later, with the increase of unemployment from East Germany, 40 hate groups sprung up to protest immigration. In Rostock in 1992, 45 Turkish immigrants were burned to death in a firebombing by German skinheads. And these are the skinheads. Uh, okay. Uh, tension between the majority Hutu and the ruling Tutsi of Rwanda had been going on for centuries. Periodic massacres had taken place between the military, the Tutsi, and the Hutu. The Tutsi were the ones doing the massacring, and the Hutu were the ones being uh, massacred. In 1995, when the Hutu government came to power, the Hutu went on a rampage that took 750,000 lives, mostly Tutsi. Uh, if you uh, have... Uh, Back in the 60s, there was a dance called the Watusi, and the Watusi was named after the, the Tutsi. The Tutsi are tall and slender people, and the Hutu are short and, uh, well, they're not, they're, they're more squat. Uh, so it was, uh, and this, you can see the Rwanda, the, the people are trying to flee Rwanda. And if you've ever seen the movie Hotel Rwanda, it's about, uh, uh, someone trying to, to save the, uh, the Tutsi. Researchers were shocked to discover that a Canadian survey in 1994 showed that 29% of married women had experienced physical and sexual assault from their spouses. The Canadian image of politeness took a heavy blow. And these are uh, Canadian uh, what, um, people. <laughs> 1990s were a time of increased police presence in the United States and a decrease in crime. However, sensational crime still gripped the headlines. Foreign tourists were robbed and murdered from airports in Florida. Germans seemed to be prime targets because they were, had more money. Ranting teens assaulted women in New York. 29 students and teachers were killed from 1997 to 1999 in student shootings in Kentucky, Oregon, Mississippi, and Colorado, and that's between 1997 and 1999. Two billion dollars a day is spent on arms and armies in the world. In the last 100 years, 250 wars have been fought worldwide at a cost of 110 million lives. Whereas wars prior to the 20th century tended to be, be between armies, at least when Europeans are fighting other Europeans, in the 20th century, man learned to make war on entire populations, and that seems to be what's happening in uh, the Ukraine. In Ukraine, we don't call it the Ukraine anymore. Uh, Russia uh, seems to be targeting uh, civilians as much as they're targeting uh, military uh, personnel. Aggression is physical or verbal behavior intended to hurt someone. Psychologists identify two types of aggression. Hostile aggression is uh, aggression driven by anger and performed as an end to itself. This type of aggression is called effective aggression. Instrumental aggression is a means to some other end other than injuring the other individual. A child seizing a toy would be instrumental aggression. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. This is wrong. Okay. I have the wrong one. Not sure where the other one is. Maybe that's it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, I'm sorry. That was the wrong one. I don't think I've missed any slides. Nope. Okay. <clears throat> Most murders represent a hostile aggression by someone who knows. Oh, I'm sorry. Who knows the victim all too often? Uh, someone who is or was romantically involved with the victim. And this is from a uh, movie called Contact Murders, made in 1958. Instrumental aggression occurs in murders when the death of the victim furthers the murderers, as in the case of the cold, calculated killings of crime syndicates. And, of course, that's what this is supposed to be. This is romance. The question that many people have asked over the course of humanity is, are humans instinctually aggressive, or is it society that makes them aggressive? Rousseau felt that society made people aggressive, but Freud in his theory sided with Darwin. Human aggression is the extension 
of the animal instincts that we cannot control. And uh, Rousseau was, was backed by a guy by the name of Carl Rogers. Uh, he was a humanist. Um, and actually, I trained, not under him, of course, but I trained using his theory. So uh, you can, if you want to say, what the hell is Bradway? Oh, he's, the, he's a humanist. That's what I am. I'm a humanist. Anyway, using Egan's model. Uh, so if anybody asks you what type of counseling I was uh, trained in, it was, uh, it was Rogerian therapy. The instinct theory uh, follows the Freudian and Darwinian concept that man is just as aggressive as any animal due to instincts. Darwin and later Freud and Lorenz saw aggression as more adaptive than destructive. Just as males and species will be territorial, humans are selectively territorial as well, protecting their food sources and reproductive potential. However, detractors of the instinct theory argue that there are variations of aggression in different cultures. The detractors also point out that different instinct theorists have identified over 14,000 instincts, although this was done mostly before the 1930s, and most of them have been disproven over time. The neural aspect of aggression can be studied in both humans and animals. Mapping the pathway of aggression, researchers have discovered that human aggressive response is very similar to that of the lowest vertebrates. Thus, aggression is as old as the reptilian brain. Research shows that people who perpetrate egregiously horrendous crimes found that the prefrontal lobe, which acts to reason uh, control of aggression, is 14% smaller in murderers and 15% smaller in antisocial men. Genetic influences, uh, heredity uh, influences the neural system sensitivity to aggressive cues. Research with other species shows that aggression can be bred out of a species through selective breeding over several generations. When pedigrees uh, are uncertain or wild species such as wolves are introduced, the outcome can be tragic as is evidenced by the 4.5 million dog attacks per year. In 2010, there were 34 fatal dog attacks on humans. Most of the 4.5 million victims were children Half had been bitten in the face. There were 40 fatalities in 2020, and there were 43 fatality dog bite fatalities in 2021. And you can see a list of the people that were uh, that were attacked and killed uh, in on Wikipedia. All you need to do is type in there uh, "dog fatal dog attacks," and it will give you a list of all the people that were killed. A lot of kids uh, because they were bitten in the face. <clears throat> uh, from 1982 to 2006, the Presa Canario were uh, involved in only 30 attacks, but six of them led to death. Presa Canario is, is one of the largest dogs, uh, heaviest dogs uh, in the world, and they were bred to uh, be guard dogs. So, yeah, kind of dangerous. Between 1982 and 2006, German Shepherd and German Shepherd mixes were involved with in 94 attacks and 13 resulted in death. Between 1982 and 2006, pit bulls were involved in 1,110 attacks and 104 resulted in death. Of the fatalities in 2020, 65% involved pit bulls or pit bull mixes. In 2021, 58% of the fatalities involved pit bulls. And of course, I already told you 43 and 40 uh, were the number of fatalities, but pit bulls. Uh, between 1982 and 2006, Rottweilers were involved in 409 attacks, and 58 resulted in death. These are Russian women holding uh, tame foxes. Uh, why do I have a picture of Russian women holding tame foxes? Uh, because the Russians decided that, that they were going to try to control uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, so they took uh, wild foxes and they bred them for, uh, uh, they tried to breed the aggression out of them. And what they discovered was they could do it, and they did it. They also 
uh, most of the foxes in, in uh, Russia are red foxes. Uh, they also bred out the, the red, red fur. <laughs> and what they said was that uh, if a fox looks, the more a fox looks like a, a, a wild red fox, uh, the more aggressive that they are. Uh, the interesting thing was uh, the less they look like a fox, uh, you can see the ears of uh, the fox ears kind of point straight up. The more they pointed uh, sideways, uh, the less uh, aggressive they were. Uh, so, so the more the less they looked like a fox, the less aggressive they were. As strange as that may seem, uh, they were also able to uh, to uh, uh, breed a aggression into foxes, and those they had to put down. Uh, because they couldn't control them, uh, but they were uh, they used genetics to uh, to create foxes and f uh, to create tame foxes. And foxes, of course, uh, if you go to Russia today, you can people will, you'll see people walking their foxes. Uh, there's not a lot of them, of course, but uh, they uh, they have tame foxes in uh, in Russia. As weird as that is. <clears throat> Biochemical influences, uh, blood chemistry will change neural sensitivity. Research and police records indicate that violent people are more likely to <gasps> drink alcohol. Violent people are more likely to become aggressive when they become intoxicated. Uh, what type of, uh, of liquor are we talking about? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, the stronger the spirits, the, uh, the more violent the behavior. Uh, so if you're taking tequila shots, that's pretty strong stuff. Uh, vodka, uh, whiskey, uh, the, uh, the strong spirits. Beer loads you up with carbohydrates. And for that reason, uh, people who drink beer are nearly tend not to be as aggressive. But of course, you know, any intoxication uh, can cause uh, violent behavior. Intoxicated people are more likely to give a stronger shock when instructed to shock a person. Uh, they're more likely to get angrier when they think about relationship conflicts. And that's one of the reasons why there are bar fights. One of the reasons I do not go to bars is because, well, for one thing, I don't drink. But another reason is because it seems like every time I go to a bar, and I haven't done this since the 70s or 80s, but it seems like every time I went to a bar, there was always a fight. And all, it was always the biggest guy picked out the littlest guy. And doggone it if I wasn't always the littlest guy in the room. So I'm, I'm always, I seem to always be a target for the, for the you know, the Bluto character. I needed my spinach, I guess. <clears throat> Four in ten violent crimes are committed by people who have been drinking. Just over half of rapists have been drinking before they commit their offense. 80% of the women in college survey who report unwanted intercourse had been drinking or taking drugs before a sexual attack. In 65% uh, of homicides and 55% of in-home fights and assaults, one or both of the individuals involved were drinking. And that is because it increases aggressive behavior. Alcohol is inhibitory. Unfortunately, what is normally inhibited, what it normally inhibits, is an individual's reasoning powers. It makes them less self-aware and unable to consider the consequences. Testosterone is also part of the biochemical mix. Aggressive males given drugs to lower their testosterone lose their aggressive tendencies. Aggressive males tend to be edgier, more impulsive, with lower tolerance for frustration. When the testosterone levels begin to decline, aggressive tendencies begin to decline as well. And uh, what is it? Uh, you lose 10% a decade after the age of 30 uh, of your testosterone. So, so us 70-year-olds are uh, operating on, on half, half our testosterone. Uh, men convicted of unprovoked violent crimes tend to have higher testosterone levels than men who commit nonviolent crimes. Males past puberty with high testosterone levels are more prone to delinquency, hard drug use, and aggressive responses to provocation. 
In contrast to the aggression causing testosterone, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that controls the effects of testosterone in the hypothalamus. Uh, that's where that's the, the amygdala is right uh, right beside the uh, the hypothalamus. It's the serotonin in the hypothalamus that controls the uh, aggressive uh, testosterone. So the more serotonin you have, the less testosterone uh, it affects you. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why when people take selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and increase their serotonin level, one of the things that goes away is their aggressive tendencies. Another thing that goes away is their sex drive because testosterone in both males and females creates your sex drive. It doesn't go away. It, it, uh, it tempers it. Low serotonin uh, levels have been found in violence-prone children and adults. Uh, people at lower socioeconomic levels tend to have low so serotonin levels. The frustration aggression theory was first uh, purported by Dollard and Miller just before World War II. The theory states that when someone is frustrated, they are blocked from achieving their goal-directed behavior, they respond with aggressive behavior. Often the aggression is not directly aimed at the frustrating entity, but is displaced on someone else. It is directed at someone less dangerous. Okay, so what are we talking about? Before World War II, what was the argument? Uh, the argument was that uh, Germany was, uh, because they had lost World War I, they lost a lot of their territory. And now that it was uh, 1939, uh, they needed to expand. Uh, they were frustrated because uh, some of their lands had been taken away from them. And so the idea was that uh, they, they were becoming frustrated, and because of that, that's what caused World War II, uh, the frustration of, uh, of, being, uh, uh, of, of being in too small an area. And this is one of the reasons, this is one of the excuses for World War II. The frustration aggression uh, theory. The same thing that they said the same thing about the Japanese. People living in fragile economic or political environments, people of low socioeconomic status, tend to react to economic disappointments with aggressive behavior, often in the form of crime. Usually, these individuals suffer from deprivation, the realization that they don't have what someone else has. Relative dep deprivation is the realization that one does not have what a comparable entity has. When aggressive acts are rewarded, the individual may learn to act aggressively in the future. This occurs in youth hockey or uh, uh, our playgrounds and with terrorists. When terrorists are negotiated with, terrorist acts begin to increase. When they are punished, they tend to decrease. Albert Bandura first proposed his social learning theory back in the early 1960s. His experiments with children modeling aggressive behavior has changed the way that we look at violent television programming and violent sporting events. And it's also used when we're talking about violent gaming. Children of physically punitive parents tend to use aggression when relating to others. Looking at the genealogy of physically punitive families, such behavior can often be traced back to several generations where the paper trail tends to end what the abusive physical punishment didn't. 30% of abused uh, children become abusive parents, four times the national rate. Absentee parents also lead to violent behavior. 70% uh, of juveniles in detention have only one parent at home. American children raised without fathers are seven times more likely to be abused, to drop out of school, to become runaways, to become unmarried teenage parents, and to commit violent crimes. Two-parent families have increased care, uh, more positive discipline, more educational achievement, fewer uprootings, and a higher income. Researchers have discovered that certain types of people have gravitated to areas of the country where they could act out their aggression. Southerners tend to advocate violence and corporal punishment. Murder rates are four times that of the average northern city, and spanking is more prevalent in the South. 18% of non-white and 36% of white Southerners believe that a man has the right to kill to protect his home, 
and are twice as likely to own a gun as a Midwesterner. Researchers have discovered that pain induces both humans and other species to strike out at the closest target. Leonard Berkowitz uh, has found that uh, aversive stimulation from pain to irritating conditions, uncomfortable noise or temperature, can trigger hostile aggression. This aversive stimulation can even take the form of dashed expectations and personal insults. Researchers have long speculated that the warmer the temperature, the more aggressively people act. Drivers in Phoenix without air conditioners often react aggressively when stopped in traffic. Pitchers beam more batters during 90 degree weather than in weather below 80 degrees, uh, though their control is comparable in both temperature ranges. Riots in the United States during the 60s and 70s tended to occur in hot weather as compared to cold weather. And this is a picture of the Newark riots in 1967. It was in July, hot, hot summer. When people are attacked or insulted, they are more likely to respond with aggression. Crowding is the feeling that there is too little space for, per person. People in densely crowded cities report feeling more fearful than people in less crowded areas. Even when the city has a lower crime rate, people still feel more uncomfortable on the streets. And speaking of heat, one of the things that's happening this weekend in Europe is they're having a, a heat wave, something that they've never seen before. Uh, so the cities in Europe, uh, London, for example, they're on a red alert because of all the heat. Uh, so it should be interesting to, to see if uh, the, uh, the heat of, uh, uh, causes any, any riots or, or anything, any negative or aggressive, overly aggressive behavior in, uh, in Europe. Researchers have discovered that aroused states, despite the cause of the arousal, will lead to a more aroused state if an emotional cue is introduced. Therefore, anger can lead to sexual passion, as can fear. People are more likely to react with extreme emotions after being stimulated with bright lights or loud noises, as in a rock concert. Research by Leonard Berkowitz uh, has shown that select items can be used as cues to aggression. Berkowitz used a gun to trigger more violent behavior. Anderson found that guns prime hostile thoughts and punitive judgments. And the gun that they used was an automatic. 79% of U.S. murders in 2020, 19,384 out of 24,576, involved a firearm. So the next time somebody tells you more people are killed with a hammer than a gun, you can say, I don't think that's correct. <clears throat> a little over half, 53% of all suicides in 2020, 24,292 out of 45,979 involved a gun, a percentage that has generally remained stable in recent years. A handgun in the home is more likely to kill household members than intruders. And owners are 2.7 times more likely to be shot, sometimes by their own hand. The United States has four times the population of Great Britain and 16 times the murders. The United States has 10,000 handgun killings a year, while Australia has 12 and Canada has 100. Pornography and sexual violence. Uh, researchers have found that violent pornography tends to give men a skewed idea of sexual response and tends to distort an individual's perception of how women actually respond to sexual coercion. Research shows that men who view erotic films have decreased attraction for their partner, have increased acceptance of extramarital uh, sex, have an increased perception of women in sexual terms. While storylines from Gone with the Wind uh, to Down with Love purport that women often say no when they really mean yes, pornography takes romantic and usually foreplay out of the equation and leaves only the sexual overpowering male overwhelming the resistance of the impassioned female. Depending on the type of pornography, pain, degradation, and injury may be a part of the equation as well. When men watch violent films, it tends to desensitize them to the depictions of violence and rape. 
Studies show that they become unsympathetic to victims of domestic violence and rate the injuries of victims as less severe. Correlational studies of the increase of pornography and rape cases show that as access to pornography increased, the number of rape case, uh, cases increased as well. However, the connection between violent sex crimes and pornography may not be directly drawn. While rapists, child molesters, and serial killers tend to use more pornography than non-offenders, the pornography may be more of a symptom than a cause of their deviance. Interviews with serial rapist Ted Bundy related that he used sexual violent, sexually violent pornography to prime himself for the rapes and murders that followed. It is estimated that 28% of women in the United States have experienced a sexual co co uh, coercive uh, episode that would fit the criteria for rape. Most didn't label the episode rape because it didn't involve violence or a stranger. Rape statistics in Canada show 23% of the women have been raped. Germany, 17%. New Zealand, 25%. United Kingdom, 19%. South Korea, 22%. Now, the problem with those statistics is <clears throat> that the definition of rape in different countries is not the same. It is estimated that 75% of stranger rapes, nearly all acquaintance rapes, uh, and nearly all acquaintance rapes, goes unreported. Surveys of college-age males shows that a full 33% would consider sexual assault if they could be assured that they would never be discovered. 33%, one out of every three guys, if he could get away with it, he would rape somebody. That's shocking. These are college age, well, they're, they're college age males. Uh, I'm guessing that the uh, the survey was taken uh, at a college as well. So these these aren't your blue collar workers uh, uh, scrounging for a dollar uh, in in a factory situation. <clears throat> these are your best and your brightest. Men who are the most likely to rape are sexually coercive, dominance demonstrated in their aggression, uh, hostile toward women, and sexually promiscuous. In many cases, pornography supports and cultivates this mindset. <clears throat> Televisions are more prevalent in homes than bathtubs or telephones. Two-thirds of homes have three or more sets. We have two in my house. Uh, the television is on an average of seven hours a day. Not in my house. Each member of the family watches an average of four hours of programming. Not in my house. Uh, women watch more television than men. Probably not in my house either. I watch more <coughs> than my wife. Non-whites watch uh, more television than whites. Of course, there's only white people in my, my household. Preschoolers and retired people watch the most. And we don't have pre any preschoolers or retired. Oh, my wife's retired, but she doesn't watch very often. Less ed educated watched more than the highly educated. Of course, everybody in my house is highly educated. Both of us are highly educated. Six in ten television shows contain violence. Fist fights were long drawn out affairs, unlike reality, where injury usually limits the fight uh, due to a broken jaw or broken hand. Three quarters of the time, the aggressors went unpunished. 58% of the time, the victims were not shown uh, to exhibit pain. Uh, only 5% of the violence was shown to have long-term consequences. Two-thirds depicted violence as funny. Children spend more time watching television than they spend in school. By junior high, the average child has observed 8,000 mil, 8, uh, 8, 8, uh, murders and 100,000 other violent acts. Some supporters of television violence and pornography as well purport that TV violence acts as a cathartic release, actually reducing the amount of violence. Research shows that television desensitizes people to violence. Television also does not represent a realistic world. It tends to have more male characters. 67% uh, 60, of the characters on television are male, and only 51% of the characters in real life are male. Most uh, people aren't married. Uh, only 10% are married on television. 61% of the, of the U.S. population are married. 
Most are blue collar workers, only 25% of blue collar workers, whereas 67% of the people in the United States are blue collar workers. Most seem to have no religious affiliation, only 6% are religious, whereas 88% of people in the United States are religious. They consume more alcohol than normal, uh, 45% uh, consume alcohol, whereas only 16% consume alcohol on a regular basis in real life. Surveys of people who watch a great deal of television shows that they view the world as a more violent place than it actually is. They're more fearful of someone coming into their home and more fearful of going outside and being attacked. These individuals also are more likely to read aggression into others' behavior and interpret words as aggressive rather than neutral. Brian Mullen analyzed information from 60 lynchings that took place in the United States between 1899 and 1946 and discovered that the larger the number of people that attend attended the lynching, the more vicious the murder and mutilation. And this is due to de-individuation. Uh, this is not actually somebody uh, hanging. Uh, this is a crowd of people at a lynching, but that's not the actual person. This is a lynching before the lynching takes place. Similar behavior can be seen with youth gangs, soccer fans, especially in England, soldiers, urban rioters, uh, school children in Scandinavia. Strangely enough, uh, enough this is called mobbing. Uh, the children will repeatedly harass or attack an insecure and weak schoolmate. This is in Scandinavia. It's known as mobbing. Mob rules with a pack mentality, even in Scandinavia among toddlers. Yeah, it's so weird. European soccer violence. These are Russians, and who knows who this guy is? I'm not sure. Catharsis. Uh, psychologists suggest allowing people a harmless way to vent their anger and aggression. However, while catharsis seems to work with other emotions, with aggression it, seems, it just seems to add extra fuel to the fire. Myers sees the only way of reducing aggression is to model and reward sensitivity and cooperation. And that is the end of the chapter. So that's the end of our lecture. So next week uh, we'll do chapter 13 and that'll be it. Uh, prejudice is the topic of next week's lecture.